and one. All right, everybody, welcome. This is uh, this is episode ten. Crazy that we've we've done the big ten. Um, it's Thursday, and it's a very rainy day here. Uh, but this episode is going to be a very great one. I feel like we are get diversifying a lot. Uh, this guy we met two months ago. Wow, two months. Yeah, two months ago on a freelancing network wanting to work with together even though we didn't work together this is still a great relationship and a little side note is like in honestly in any industry a lot of people think like if you don't get the service or whatever it is from somebody else then you shouldn't talk to them but i usually go opposite from there because having the person who we're about to introduce justin is a great reference and great person to talk to and learn from because we're in two different industries but uh justin welcome man welcome Thank you, Manuel. Thanks for having yeah. me. Looking forward to this and, and glad to be on board for the day. Sweet. So yeah, man, um, pretty much, I know we kind of talked about what's going to happen, but this is just a good time to just kind of explain kind of who you are. Um, and then, so I'll hand it off to you and kind of explain who you are right now, what you're doing, and then we'll travel back in time and work our way back up. Sound good? Okay, great. Awesome. So um, for context, my name is Justin Jeffers. I uh, am the founder and CEO of Jay Butler, which is an online a men's loafer and leather goods company. We sell moccasin style loafers. Um, think, uh, you know, casual loafers like the Gucci bit loafer, you know, your, your region, very easy to wear uh, shoes. Um, I'm also a student at University of California, Berkeley, at the Haas School of Business getting my MBA. And I, although I'm from outside of Philadelphia, I currently live in San Francisco and I've lived out here for about the last year and a half. Sweet, sweet. So how's, how's it been right now with, um, have the protests still happening around you? Um, so funny enough, um, right around me, no, not really. I, I live quite close to the mayor here in San Francisco. Uh -huh. Um, and uh, although I was gone two weekends ago, there were some protests uh, on our block. Um, and they migrated to the local CVS and broke out the windows and, and looted the store. Mm -hmm. That was the only protest in our specific neighborhood. In other parts of the city, there have obviously been some protests and, and other parts of the Bay Area, Oakland and, and Berkeley and, and San Jose and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. my specific neighborhood uh, hasn't really had much. It's a pretty residential neighborhood. Um, so this may not be like the most exciting um, headline grabbing part of town. To <laughs> but no. there's certainly, I mean, it's San Francisco. So, so there certainly have been some out here. Right. Awesome. Sweet. Sounds good. So yeah, we're going to basically just like just travel all the way back in time. So kind of just tell us how life was, you know, growing up, family. Um, yeah. So, so thanks for asking. Um, as I said, I'm from outside Philadelphia, a small town called Bryn Mawr. It's, uh, you know, 20, 30 minutes outside of Center City, Philadelphia. Um, and uh, pretty much lived my whole life there until going to college. Um, you know, my, I was raised as an only child, although mm -hmm. I have two half siblings who both live out here in the Bay Area. Um, so, you know, I guess you could say maybe some of the stereotypes of only children. Mm -hmm. uh, I probably have some of those. I don't always share well, uh, <laughs> sometimes, but not always, you know, I can be a brat. Um, and I don't always compromise well. Sometimes I do, but not always. I'm working on it. Mm -hmm. Um, progress, not perfection. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, went through, uh, elementary school and middle school and, and high school, um, you know, was certainly not, uh, the best student. I was very choosy with the classes that I would, you know, really do well in. Mm -hmm. If it was a class that I enjoyed and that I uh, liked the teacher in, mm -hmm. I would do well. And if it was a class I didn't really see the merit in, or I was like, I don't like the, the teacher, didn't always do well. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it was kind of a, a funny academic journey for me, um, you know, throughout school. And, and as I've gotten older, I've gotten a little more maybe um, mature about uh, trying to do better in school or doing better in school. Mm -hmm. From a social standpoint, I was always very social um, and probably will continue to be that way. I feed off of other people's energy. Mm -hmm. So you're more um, like introverted. Yeah. And, and, you know, what you were saying about, you know, even though we're not working together, like, and, you know, you initially followed up, I was like, yeah, that's cool. Like, I, I appreciate that. I respect that. Because I do believe in, you know, just because you don't work with someone, you know, it doesn't mean you can't maintain a relationship if there's learnings that you can have from each other. Mm -hmm. Or if they're, you know, let's say one day I'm like, hey, Manuel, like one of my buddies was looking for, you know, someone, he, maybe he's a dentist or a mm -hmm. lawyer and they want to build out their practice. You know, I can be like, okay, well, you know, I, I know a guy who, you know, specializes in that and I can, you know, refer them to you. Um, mm -hmm. So there, there's that, you know, argument for doing it too. And just from building up a nice network and, and uh, of, of peers and people that you can talk business with and stuff like that. So um, I do feed off other people's energy with the caveat of um, I certainly like to have my own time to recharge. Um, mm -hmm. There is that kind of like introverted side yeah. um, to me and, and 
um, you know, whether it's, you know, watching Star Wars, I'm currently uh, watching The Clone Wars. I'm going to go through all 121 <laughs> episodes. Um, There's a I'm friend a of mine. Fan. I hope he's watching this because <clears throat> he is a huge, he was actually one of the episodes on here and he's a huge Clone nice. Wars guy. Yeah. Nice. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I've watched maybe the half of the first season and, and the, the movie, um, but I haven't watched the other, you know, six seasons. Um mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm pretty excited for it. Um, you know, it fits nicely between, you know, Attack of the Clones and, and Revenge of the Sith. But I, mm-hmm. we, that can be a whole other podcast. <laughs> so I'm not going to drag you down into that rabbit hole. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so, yeah. So that's, uh, you know, childhood upbringing, you know, had very loving, very supportive parents. Um, mm-hmm. And they continue to be supportive, you know, even as I've gone into my 30s, which I'm very fortunate to have. Um, so I'm, I'm very grateful for that as well. And they, they tried to and, and I think pretty successfully instilled a pretty good work ethic, uh, not always disciplined, but when I'm committed to something, I'm very involved and very engaged. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's something that they pass along to me, whether it's engagement in your community through philanthropy or charitable means, or whether it's, you know, uh, how to prioritize your know, job and, <clears throat> excuse me, career success, um, stuff like that. Um, they, they both came from, you know, very blue collar families and kind of have that salt of the earth uh, feel and work ethic. And that's something that I, that I really, uh, you know, appreciated. That's and awesome. I really appreciate. That's awesome. And, and thank you for sharing that. And also I feel like when you did kind of mention your, even the, the, the times that we've spoken, you're always a person who like, you have like a vision where it's not like, yes, you're focused on right now, but it's also like what happens after the next couple of steps. When you mentioned in school, how like there's some classes where you did well, some classes you didn't like, where do you think that came from that kind mm-hmm. of like, picky, not to say picky, kind of like picking through your vegetables pretty much of what mm-hmm. you want to eat. Like, what do you think that came from? Like, did that impact who you were or how'd that go? Uh, it was mostly uh, a result of, I would say, motivation. And, mm-hmm. and I could argue that it, it parlays well into entrepreneurship where, you know, an entrepreneur is not going to start a business in a field that they're not passionate about or very interested in. Mm-hmm. And class was, was the same way for me in that, you know, English class never really cared much about English or some of like the, the books that we'd have to read. Now, some I, I thought were quite good and quite interesting. Mm-hmm. A lot of them I was like, this sucks. Or like cursive writing, which now I wish I would have <laughs> done, like really excelled at cursive writing, right. but I think it's very elegant and, and there's a romance to it. Um, but, you know, yeah. retrospective history. Um, but a lot of it was just about what was interesting to me mm-hmm. and, you know, how engaged can I be in the class? Like what, you know, maybe in high school, for instance, I, I, almost have always enjoyed history. So that, that mm-hmm. was a subject that I typically would do well in. And I liked the storytelling aspect to it. And I liked a lot of the teachers that I would have in, in history class. So that was one that I was easily engaged in. Math was like kind of hit and miss science. Mm-hmm. Although I found interesting, I always felt like the way it was taught was kind of boring. Right. So that was like kind of a mixed bag. Um, but then art, you know, I loved, I loved that expression and that uh, way to, you know, think about yourself and emotions and whatever it is you're viewing, whether it's photographing something or you're uh, filming something or you're painting or sketching something. Mm-hmm. Um, it was really about how interesting did I find a subject and how engaged could I find myself within it? Mm. And, and also what value did I feel like I was getting long-term out of it? And there was certainly some short-sightedness that I had of, you know, maybe not investing a bit more time into some of my classes, certainly. Mm-hmm. Um, but a lot of it was just kind of interest level. Gotcha. Being, being immature. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like I'm the same being way totally for honest. me. Yeah. If for me, if it wasn't until like senior year, like I really enjoyed my classes. Cause I remember we, I, I took, I told myself senior year, I'm going to take the most really random, but law and justice, mm-hmm. uh, literature is film. And like, I can't remember what the class was, but we pretty much just, just read books. Like you just picked whatever he would give you a category and you just pick books. But those classes, I honestly learned so much more than I did in the past couple of years because mm-hmm. in the law and justice class, the teacher was a very old teacher and just straight to the point blunt. And he mm-hmm. would just teach us about different, I mean, different laws we would do. Um, we would basically do trials and everything and just kind of like real life things. Cause even him, mm-hmm. he was like, school is good. But at the end of the day, when you're going grocery shopping, you're not going to do the Pythagorean theorem of bananas, the oranges and <laughs> kind of everything. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, so yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So, so after, after high school and kind of going to your college, cause I know you said you're from Philadelphia, but you're in Sacramento. So I don't know if that's big of a jump, like what led you to go from Philly mm-hmm. to 
just you know to Sacramento and what was that what happened in that time mm-hmm. um so good 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 question and it was actually school that brought me out here um and and I'm in in San Francisco uh, not, not Sacramento San although they're, they're very San close Francisco. to each other mm-hmm. um so and the one thing I should say about school is I especially now even when I was younger I I do like the challenge of learning and I do like intellectual engagement mm-hmm. um I just need to be you know motivated and engaged <laughs> um you know, to, to, to answer your question of kind of what got me out here, which I think was what you were asking, correct? Mm-hmm. It was, uh, you know, Jay Butler, my brand, um, I was thinking, okay, what are the next steps for the brand? Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's doing okay, maybe not quite as well as I would have hoped, you know, like many startups, you know, things aren't always quite rosy. Mm-hmm. And so I was saying, what are the next steps? Am I going to go get a job? Am I going to go for, you know, a graduate degree, you know, both of them or, or something else altogether. And I ended up selecting the graduate degree path. And so as I was applying to schools, you know, across the country in you know, Boston, Philadelphia, um, you know, Chicago, you know, San Francisco, you know, LA, Seattle, you name it. Um, you know, I, I ended up at uh, Berkeley in mm-hmm. Berkeley, you know, right across the, the Bay from San Francisco. And so that's what initially brought me out to the Bay area. Mm-hmm. Um, now, why I chose Berkeley, there was you know, a whole number of reasons. Um, part of it was having family out here. Part of it, it you know, it's a phenomenal school. There's a good culture there. It's, it's, it's dif- differentiated based upon its culture, mm-hmm. I would argue, more so than other schools, um, which can be good or, and or bad, um, right. depending on um, you know, how you view it and, and what your priorities are. Um, and it was a school that uh, has great feeders into a lot of tech and retail companies and also mm-hmm. a good emphasis on entrepreneurship. Right. Um, and those were all things that I was kind of, you know, interested in to, to varying degrees. Got it. So yeah, it was, it was, you made a very like good decision on honing, like going somewhere pretty much that's going to amplify your focuses or kind of lead you to paths that you like pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. And, and finding an area, like I was between here uh, and, and UCLA and University of Washington, mm-hmm. and also in terms of finding a, a city that I thought I would be happy in or that I wanted to be in as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, you know, I, I saw myself being the most, fulfilled or most satisfied in the Bay area versus the other two cities, mm-hmm. um, was, it was another part of it too. Got it. Awesome. Sweet. And so as we go back, um, I know about it because after I read into you and just kind of a little more about it, but I know before Jay Butler, you kind of had another, you know, still a venture that you're doing. Um, mm-hmm. but what got you to the fashion? Cause like fashion is something where a lot of people, you know, like, hey, I want to start a t-shirt brand. I want to start mm-hmm. this, but like the way, like, I've, yeah, like the way I've seen you do it, it's it, it's it's very calculated in a good way because you're doing things that like action wise. So, kind of, what mm-hmm. got you into the fashion industry? Yeah, so good, good question. Um, and I think what you're referring to is the fine gentleman, which is it's mm-hmm. still kind of going. I kind of relaunched it, uh, and and it's a, a a love of mine and a passion project. But it's a blog on men's style and, mm-hmm. and clothing. Um, what, what initially got me into fashion, I guess, to go back to when I was 15, um, and this is not, you know, out there too much, but I modeled for Abercrombie once, and I was Ooh. actually, like, I was, like, the guy who was on the big-ass, larger-than-life photos in the store. <laughs> so, you, but, okay. But, what? but it wasn't, it wasn't, like, Abercrombie and Fitch, so it was, like, the under-18 store, so I wasn't, uh-huh. like, sure, I don't have a six-pack like that, like, that's <laughs> not totally me. Uh-huh. Um, but it was funny because uh, it came about because they were doing a, a photo shoot in Philadelphia and um, they needed one more male model. They had three males and four females and they needed an even breakdown. And so they fanned out their scouts to like some of the schools outside Philadelphia and they do like someone upon me. He's like, this is our guy. I'm like, all right, dude, like I'm just trying to play lacrosse because we were at lacrosse practice. Right. Random dude was standing there. We're like, what is this creepy dude doing? Yeah. It's kind but of anyway, sus. so <laughs> that was my first like formal foray into fashion. And I actually like thought it was a cool experience, but like kind of hated myself for doing it. I was like, Oh man, I like totally sold out. And uh-huh. <laughs> like, the, like high school punk rocker stoner. And he was like, man, like you sold out and like, this is bullshit. And, uh-huh. um, but fast forward a few years, I became more deliberate in how I would dress. And my, my taste was not always there, but some of the decisions of what I would wear was deliberate. And then when I fast forward a couple more years, graduated college, moved up to New York and was in a client facing job as, as an auditor at, uh, at a, one of the big four firms. And I was like, you know what, like, I want to show up, I want to look presentable, I want to dress well. And, you know, I just graduated college. It's not like I have a crazy budget. Mm-hmm. So, like, I can't exactly afford Ralph Lauren, like Brooks Brothers and just Tom Ford. <laughs> yeah, I mean, still shit, still can't afford Tom Ford. Um, <laughs> but, uh, 
but I was like, you know, and I don't want to go like Jose Bang because like all that stuff is like parachute pants decisions, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> Like there's gotta be a way to like, like right. Uh-huh. There's gotta be a way to to dress well and to you know find brands that you know can appeal to guys like me. And I saw there were some brands, but no one's really writing about them. So I kind of at the same time looking at, for like a, a an artistic outlet mm-hmm. uh, from my accounting job, which was not always the most like intellectually fulfilling thing, um, although professionally satisfying, not intellectually satisfying. Um, and then also kind of fostering this interest in men's clothing and, and menswear, I was like, you know, let's start a blog on this. And that's when I really got serious into menswear. Like everything was deliberate. Like mm-hmm. I'm a believer that everything in art is done for a purpose. And I'm not saying that menswear is art, but there's certainly an artistic aspect to it. Right. And you have like the business side of it. You have the, you know, the, the traditions and the history side of it. You have the, you know, artistic expression of self and of like kind of belonging to a tribe or of a group of people. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's the, the, you know, everyone cites like sociology 101 is like, you know, you, you have a uniform, like police have a uniform because it builds like credibility or doctors have, you know, mm-hmm. the white lab coat because like that's the doctor's uniform. Like it builds credibility and like it right. allows you to like align them with a certain role or station, whatever. It's kind of like an alter ego. Like I've noticed like when you put on a certain shirt, you become some, not you become, but there's that like Aurora that you have inside of you. Yeah. Hundred percent. So you know that's what really got me into to fashion and menswear and and kind of set the stage for the things to come with building up the fine gentleman and then you know kind of uh, segueing that into uh, Jay Butler. Got it. Wow, that's awesome. And regarding fashion, it's a very my brother's the one who's kind of like in forced me into inside fashion a couple of years ago. I- yeah, and so like my first, I remember I got um, we had my godparents used to own like a big transport company and one of their clients was a big like a guy who just loved fashion and everything and he unfortunately passed away and so they passed on the stuff that he used to wear from the family and it was all my size so I remember I got um I believe it was JJ no JJ Murphy I don't think it's JJ Murphy oh um Alan Edmonds I have a bunch of Alan Edmonds shoes shoes, yeah boots um and that was really where I got into it because I looked at the shoe and I'm like this shoe is just not I mean, every shoe is not just put together, but there's like a thought behind this and really mm-hmm. diving in deep to the history of just why they chose this small part to kind of mix with it. Just very interesting. Yeah. Um, so for you, for, you know, before we go into um, the blog, so for fashion, what are some things, I want to say some tips, some tips mm-hmm. for, for uh, the men, the men watching. I know this is kind of <laughs> specific, um, young, old, what are some tips that you kind of see mm-hmm. with fashion that you'd like to give to them? Because I know everybody tries to copy people, but sometimes some things may not fit you. Yeah, literally. yeah. Like, <laughs> you know, like the shirt you're wearing, for instance, like, right. I, you're like I, just, I just cannot make it look as good as you are. Oh, like, it, man, I'm blessed. My... <laughs> it, it, it's just, you know, it's just not my style. Right. Um, whereas for you, it, I think it works very well for your style. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it's, a lot of it is about knowing yourself and having self-awareness. Mm-hmm. You know, what, what, um, both in the sense of emotionally, what are you comfortable wearing? Um, for instance, if I was to wear that, you know, kind of Hawaiian pattern shirt that you're wearing, mm-hmm. I would just kind of feel uncomfortable. Like it's not really my style. Mm-hmm. Whereas like the shirt I'm wearing, it's a Navy blue polo shirt. Like this is pretty much my uniform. Like right. I wear a Navy blue polo shirt, like two, three days a week, like no mm-hmm. joke. Um, and I have like nine different ones. Um, so to me, like, this is my comfort zone. Like, I don't even have to think about it. Whereas like, it's like, ah, I don't know, like, is this, like, I don't know, good name, like, mm-hmm. what was my girlfriend thing? Like, all that stuff. Um, so there's that self-awareness part to it. The next thing you want to think about, well, and actually I should go back in that before I move forward. And that is using clothing as a form of communication. Mm. Um, you're a marketer, you know, you, you're very well-spoken. You're very you know, clear in your speaking and what a lot of people have an oversight of when it relates to clothing is that it is in fact a form of communication. Um, like an art, a painting is communicating something. How you adorn your body with clothes is another way of communicating. Going back to what we were saying about, you know, sociology and uniforms, it's very similar there. Like even, you know, the grunge, you know, movement of like the early nineties and, you know, the punks, like it, there's a deliberate look to all of that. And when you look, you know, to any culture, you know, in, in the history of humanity, there's a certain look, whether mm. it's something of belonging, there's a, always a mixture of function and form and expression. Right. Um, so how can you use clothing to communicate 
something to whoever it is you're you're meeting with or you're discussing. So within that, there's always, you know, there's the color theories, both, you know, how do people perceive blue versus red versus pink versus purple? Right. And then there's what colors look best on you as a person. Like, so, you know, your skin tone, your hair color, your eye color, depending on, like for me, I have, you know, relatively pale skin, but mm -hmm. I, I do get a nice tan in the sun, <laughs> which I will say. <laughs> um, but I have brown hair and brown eyes. So uh -huh. for me, I feel very comfortable in the earth tones world. So oh. navy blues, um, olive green, 50 shades of brown. Right. Um, and for me, like, I just don't think I look great in black. So I don't wear a lot of black. Whereas if I had black hair, I think black and gray would work a lot better on, on my, you know, with my complexion. So, so I'm be a little, I'm be a little selfish. What would you yeah, think yeah. for my skin tone would be, would be good? Like, honestly. Yeah. So for yeah. you, Black works very well. You know, uh -huh. black beard black hair works very well. Um, like rich, saturated colors because uh -huh. your 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 complexion is so like it's clear and it's uh, like strong. Uh -huh. And so, what plays off, what complements that well, are colors that are of similar kind of a strong nature and a saturated oh, wow. nature. But you uh -huh. can also play with pastels to add a really nice like contrast. Right. Uh, also. Um, okay. So I think those, those would all work well for you. Um, okay. And then the next thing I would move on to would be fit and fit at the end of the day is almost like what's most important in right. the sense of like how people perceive you. Like, I mean, if you wear a shirt, that's just like way too big and it looks baggy. <laughs> you just look like a mess. Right. Mm -hmm. Whereas you look something that like, okay, it looks like it was made for your body. It fits you well. It's not tight. It's not loose. You just look comfortable. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't consciously think it, there's certainly an unconscious bias of like, yeah, like, okay, this person looks put together. Mm -hmm. um, so fit is, is very important, it, both in terms of comfort, but both in also in terms of, of perception. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Sweet. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to make sure I rewatch that, honestly, because like, like for me, I'm just starting to learn like the more, like, for example, I like fitness, but it's like there's like mm -hmm. general just lift weights. That's it. But then like you go into it, there's actually like stretching so like for me now mm -hmm. even though i'm not old like i take like 15 to 20 minutes just to stretch before yeah. i even start working out because it's like the longevity and like with fashion i've come to find out like it really does speak you like who you are like for example <laughs> here's see if we can do this so there's there's a girl she made this like jean jacket and it mm -hmm. says go all in and like yeah. I don't know for what reason, like whenever I put this in my mind, like the mind shift is, is even like yeah. what you just explained. It's a lot different. And even when people see me with this, there's always like a, oh, wow, like I need to talk to that. Like, and that sounds egotistical, but like when I usually put it on, people are like, I need to talk to you or like, where did you get that from? Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's very interesting. Thank you. Um, yeah, no, so course. regarding like, regarding blogging, how... I know people usually want to start a blog, but they like, oh, I want to start a blog. Okay, what do you want to do? I don't know. <laughs> um, what are some hardships and some successes you've come across mm -hmm. to find um, in your in your blogging career? Mm -hmm. So I'll start with the hardships and the mistakes because I've probably made more mistakes than I've made, you know, successful or you know, smart moves. Um, and and although when I started the Fine Young Gentleman, I had an idea of what I wanted to do and I had somewhat of a vision. The vision itself, you know, now that I'm maybe a bit more uh, like financially minded and like trying to make it m like monetize the blog. Mm -hmm. um, you know, now I'm like, Oh man, I totally like lost out. But um, my goals of starting the fine general was to learn about men's clothing and style to have a, an artistic kind of outlet to get a lot of free clothes and meet people in the industry. Mm -hmm. I wasn't really necessarily trying to make money from it. And now, you know, it was nine years ago that I started it. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know what, like if I would have said, Hey, the kind of fifth pillar of that, you know, goal that you know vision whatever um oh well, it actually would be six because the, the fifth was helping guys dress better and, and having kind of an altruistic mission and, and trying to you know cater to guys who were in a similar situation as me who like you know they wanted to dress up but there weren't a ton of resources mm -hmm. um but you know had i had more of an, an eye on monetizing it uh you know that would be kind of nice <laughs> I, I certainly could have monetized it a lot more um right. so it, but it, but it's that said, the priorities that I had, the other five that I had as priorities, I think I, I did achieve those for the most part. I got a lot of free clothes. I met a lot of people, learned a lot, had a lot of fun. And it was a great express, you know, kind of outlet 
Um, and I certainly helped a lot of guys dress better. So it wasn't a failure in that respect, but now I wish I would have monetized it a lot more. I also missed out on some of the big picture things. Uh, and, and this is a general business concept is, you know, when you're so far in the weeds of building a business or strategizing or doing something, sometimes you'll miss the big picture. And so the things that I missed, for instance, would be a yes, monetizing B kind of missed out on Instagram, um, and C missed out on YouTube. Um, now part of me is, is inherently just uncomfortable with being in front of the camera and, uh, especially video and also is not the biggest fan of social media, which is why I, you know, really like the blog format because you can kind of just speak and, um, almost uh, add more in-depth content, whereas on Instagram, you can't quite add that I believe uh, to, to that extent. It's yeah. a different form of communication. It's a different medium. Um, you know, it's like painting with oil versus painting with, you know, watercolor. Right. Uh, you know, if that kind of makes sense or, or, you know, sketching in black and white versus, you know, a full color palette of, of oil paint. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I certainly had some misses there. Um, now I was able to build a, a large audience for the final gentleman. Um, and a lot of those, uh, readers came over as customers for Jay Butler later on, which was which was wow. really nice to see, and they still do at at, at times, um, which was which was awesome. And I just had a an influencer reach out to me, and uh, you know he he heard of me partly through my blog and and partly through some of my friends' blogs. So that's you know nice to see. Um, so those are some of the failures, you know, not monetizing, um, you know, missing out on the big picture of new. Um, communication mediums, YouTube and, and Instagram in particular. Um, and then also at times not planning it enough in terms of having a content plan mm -hmm. and in terms of having an overarching, Hey, this isn't just about like talking about whatever I want to talk about. Cause a lot of time it would be a stream of consciousness. I'd be like, you know what? Like today I want to talk about how or why you should wear a knit tie or we're going to review suits from Indochino. And I just kind of like take the pictures, share my thoughts. I put, I should have put more structure to both the content planning mm -hmm. and also towards the, the articles themselves. And that would have uh, led the way for it to be a stronger platform. And I think a, a more concise and more value add type of, 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 of outlet. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of hardships, um, I would say I'll, I'll tie in hardships with fine and gentlemen and, and Jay Butler, because sometimes they're similar. Mm -hmm. One of them is just, like I was just talking about just adding structure to things and figuring out there's no right answer. So how can, and you probably have this with your, you know, with your marketing practice, it's, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes there's a big delay in the reward for the, the work that you've put in, right? It takes time to build up the return on ad spend. It takes time to, you know, see the traffic grow to the site. It takes time to recognize the revenue mm -hmm. and to really attribute the revenue to the marketing efforts. So, um, you know, for, for me, it was, um, maybe a, a lack of patience sometimes and not focusing, not pushing myself enough um, was, was I would say kind of a, a hardship and, and a mistake. Um, the other hardship is the emotional battle that comes with starting your own business and trying to survive off of, you know, really eating what you kill. Um, exactly. Because at the end of the day, like you're responsible for your team and, your business, mm -hmm. you know, I'm responsible for the traffic and you know, whatever comes to find a gentleman and Jay Butler. Um, and there's certainly a, an emotional aspect that's not talked about a lot in, in entrepreneurship mm -hmm. that I think is, should not be overlooked because you have to be stubborn. You have to be persistent. You have to like kind of commit to your vision and, and commit to your idea or product or service. And you may not get results for the first like a you know, couple months or first couple of years. Like Ross Perot, when he started e, um, EDS, mm -hmm. that's how he, he made his first couple of billion. Like he got turned down by the first like 70 people. He, he started his career at IBM in like kind of com hardware like um, and computing power like sales back in like the 60s or 70s. And then he, he was like, you know what? Like there's a total unserved market here. And he started EDS. Um, and then he sold that to, I think it was General Electric made, you know, a billion, a couple billion dollars. And the first like 70 people he approached to, you know, basically become clients for EDS said, no, 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 no. And then it was like this, I don't know, it was like the 72nd or 73rd, like, okay. And then from there it was a rocket ship. Right. So, you know, just because you get rejected the first couple of times doesn't mean you're going to get rejected the ninth or the 10th time. So if you have a valued if your product or service has value to it and you really believe in that and you can continue to push it, 
be persistent, don't give up hope. Um, and you as a, as a founder need to maintain that belief in your product and, and have people in your life who believe in you to continue with this. And that's very important as well. And that's, that's first of all, thank you. That's, it's amazing because that's one of the things I started realizing the past, I mean, like a year or two years ago, it's, it's really, there is that, it's not talked about that much because a lot of people yeah. just show the Lambos, the, the role, yeah. like, you know what I mean? Like the, the Yeah, dude, it's fucking stuff. emotionally abusive profession to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> exactly, yeah. And it's like, you think about it and it's, you, there's this push and pull where like in the morning, you're like, dude, I'm on top of the world. Like, this is it. And by at night, you're like, I'm done. Let me start applying for it. <laughs> and, yeah. it's, and, it's, and, it's, and it's very important because you, the last part that you just said, everything was good. And the last part that you just said is important as like, you have to believe in yourself. Mm -hmm. you like, do. if you don't, like, it's, it's like sports. It's like, anything that you do in life because I was honestly my biggest thing is I I knew it was a weird thing if I knew the results were good because mm -hmm. the clients were saying that they were good and they were good but I didn't believe in it and I noticed the yeah. people that I didn't believe in it it fell through all the time mm -hmm. yeah and that's that's definitely that's a good point um so transitioning after the blog is how did Jay Butler you know begin like what are the what were the steps needed mentally mm -hmm. physically to, to kind of create what it is and, and what's the backstory behind it. Mm -hmm. So, so probably easy to start with the backstory and, and why Jay Butler came about. <coughs> Excuse me. And, and that would be, um, as I was writing fine and gentlemen, a couple factors were kind of coming together into one. One was, you know, I'd always wanted to start a business and I loved kind of driving a company, driving a vision, um, with fine and gentlemen, but I wanted, you know, a more, not sustainable, but a more like conventional maybe business, you know, mm -hmm. back when I started finding gentlemen in 2011 and then even 12 and 13, like blogging wasn't necessarily deemed as like a viable business. Right. Um, you know, there was like Scott Schumann of the Sertoyalist. There was Leandra Medine or whatever her last name is. I can't pronounce it. Um, at Man Repeller, like some people were starting to make. You know, like, Did he blog? Well yeah. And Aaron, yeah. he's a good guy. He's a buddy of mine. He's someone who I, who I like to for, for advice. Um, like he had just started Antonio from Roman real style, mm -hmm. but they hadn't taken off yet. And so I was also like, okay, like, is this a way to really make a business? So that's, that's a whole other thing. But, um, you know, I wanted to start a business to have, you know, to have a, take up an idea for something and, and make it into a brand. So that was one. Another was I kept getting, um, feedback and questions from readers of, Hey, where can I get a great $200 pair of like loafers mm -hmm. and I didn't really have any place to send my readers. So it was, okay, well, you know, there are a couple brands that, you know, they may have nice quality, but the style is not great or, you know, it's nice quality, nice style, but the price is way too high. Um, you know, or, you know, the, the style is right, but the quality's off. So I was like, there's gotta be a way to have all this in, in one brand and in, in one product. Um, so I knew from my audience that there was a desire for a product like what Jay Butler now offers. I didn't have to do market research. The market research was coming to me. Um, so that was, that made things pretty easy. Um, and then uh, from there, and then, oh, and at the, at the same time, you know, I was writing about all these brands that were just selling online. Um, you know, I knew that guys were warming up to, if they would buy a custom suit online, they buy a pair of loafers online. Um, and that that was certainly the, that was one big picture thing that I didn't miss. Thankfully was, you know, the rise of e-commerce right. and how, the prolifer proliferation of e-commerce would lead the way for, you know, countless businesses to, especially to, now. Yeah. Yeah. To, to, to grow and to be established and to you know, really explode. So putting those things together, I was like, okay, e-commerce, loafer company, direct consumer, um, you know, wanting to start a business, like how can I put this all together into selling and then figuring out, okay, what's going to be kind of the brand voice, the brand aesthetic, the exact type of loafer we're going to have stuff like that. Um, and you know, that was just kind of figuring out, okay, what do I want to focus on? Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, putting that packaging it together as one product in terms of the, you know, mental and like physical preparation, mental and like emotional wasn't much. It was just like, okay, like this may be really good sometimes, maybe really shitty, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, stick with the vision. Um, you know, I made a ton of mistakes, like just in terms of thinking, oh, it'll only take me six months to have this business up and running. No, it took <laughs> like 18 months. That was like idiotic of me. Right. And just like not providing as good of a structure as I could have for a lot of the workflows and for a lot of the things I was doing. Um, uh, from the startup itself, it was just figuring out how to, what are the steps that need to be taken to develop a product, to have a product produced, to have a product delivered to market. 
And that's, I mean, that's a whole nother discussion in itself, but any business is going to have to do that, whether you're offering a product or a service. Right. And that's, and that's good. I like, there's that whole stigma of that you're just going to start it, then it's just going to blow up and kind of go from there. Um, so did, yeah. when you were- St. Wayne's World, man, you build it, yeah. it will come like, that's not exactly how it works. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so when you, like, for example, what do you, what do you say are your top, um, th- I know it's hard to choose this because it's kind of like a baby. What are your top three products that you've enjoyed mm-hmm. creating? So in terms of like the, there's the commercial success, then there's the intellectual success. Mm-hmm. And I think you're, you're asking more about the latter. Um, mm-hmm. you know, what, what is kind of intellectually fulfilling? Right. So <clears throat> I would say of those, um, it's certainly not our top seller, but our, our Shipley tie loafer was, mm-hmm. I, I just love that shoe. It's basically the upper of a driving shoe where you have a little like kind of tie. Right. And it's the, the sole, you know, it's a leather sole and it's, I think a really nice blend of American kind of moccasin style loafer and the Italian driving uh, shoe. Um, and so that was really fun. That's actually the shoe that really got the brand going on the conceptual phase. Cause it was, how can initially it was, how can I bring to market like a $150 driving shoe? And then I was like, well, driving shoes, like they're cool, but those things wear out so quickly. So it's okay. Well, can we keep it a really like thin, flexible, shoe like have the feel of a driving shoe but have a little more substantial durable sole so that's why we brought you know the leather sole um so that one was was great um (coughs) excuse me i uh have also loved designing uh what is our anchorage uh duffel bag which Mm -hmm. is inspired by uh like a parachutist bag a military parachutist bag it's very boxy Uh um, and and kind of changed the proportions around that was that was a labor of love um, that, that took a while to get the right kind of specs and, and proportions with our, our, our craftsmen. Um, but really love that bag, um, which we sold more of it as well. Um, and then the third one I would say, um, would probably be our, our, um, our penny loafer, mm-hmm. our Cromwell penny loafer. And although it looks like to some eyes, just a regular penny loafer, there are a couple unique aspects to it that are subtle. And once you're kind of cued into it, once you compare them to some other shoes, you see why it is a, a aesthetically differentiated shoe. It has a shorter vamp and it has a thinner sole, again, very flexible, very soft wearing. Mm-hmm. Um, and some guys love that. It's not for every guy, but a lot of guys love that. And that's why they shop at Jay Butler right. while still being conservative and classic and traditional. Um, and so that was just really fun. Like, how can you take the most boring classic men's shoe, which like, it's pretty much a penny loafer. Yeah. And how can you just slightly tweak the balance of things to have a different perspective on that, on that product? The perspective is important in, it is. in anything that you do and anything that you are. That's, I love, I've, again, like, yeah, I told you, loafers coming into them are just the most amazing thing because not even just a slipping on, but just like how mm-hmm. versatile they are because you can yeah. either, if it's dressing up, if you're going out, whether it's just putting on like a pair of shorts and just going to the store, like I just did literally just to pick up a cold brew a little bit ago. Yeah. Um, or if it's like one of those like middays with like some joggers or something like that. It's mm-hmm. just incredible how like one piece of shoe can work for anything. Yeah. Um, yeah. So how, I know when we spoke, it was, it's crazy to think that the last time we spoke was the beginning of, of all of this. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's like the fire nation when it attacked. Um, yeah. So where, what do you, how has COVID kind of made you pivot I, I personally know a little bit because you talked about it, but how yeah. has it made you pivot and kind of start thinking with like the mindset that you have of, okay, I'm going to need to start changing some things or I'm going to mm-hmm. stop doing certain things. Yeah. So I'll start with kind of the effects that COVID has had on the business and that will help give some context into some of the things that I've, I've been working on. The biggest three effects are, or have been uh, uh, a disruption to our supply chain, like many companies you know, our, our, our supply chain in Mexico where we produce our shoes and leather goods uh, got totally messed up because they had to shut down mm-hmm. for like four, four or five or six weeks. Um, you know, the government mandated they shut down and that delayed, you know, our restock. We were very low in stock of stuff. Um, and as a result, we just didn't have the shoes to sell to our customers. Um, so the disruption supply chain was, was one. The second would be a drying up of, of demand. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, customers for a while and it's kind of come and gone in waves. You know, it's like one week people just don't want to buy anything. And the next week people are like, all right, like coronavirus is over. Let's buy stuff. And the next week it's like, wait, hold on. We don't want to buy anything. So it's, <laughs> it's kind of been like bipolar. 
um, hopefully it'll stabilize a, a little bit uh, going forward now that we have restocked. So those are two. The third is it really highlighted some deficiencies in how I had been running the company mm-hmm. and in, in terms of areas that I need to put more focus towards. And primarily that is, and I had already been thinking and planning to do this stuff before coronavirus hit. So in January and February, I was kind of thinking, you know, what's going to be the goals for the brand this year? Mm-hmm. And how is it going to play in with, with you know, a summer internship and a, you know, my, my school activities um, and commitments. And so I already wanted to redo the business or redo the website and maybe add some new products and, um, you know, bring in some additional staff to help with the you know, photo video editing, marketing, you know, copywriting, whatever. Um, mm-hmm. But what coronavirus did was really highlight the, the deficiency in our organizational structure of not having those things already in place mm-hmm. for when a crisis hit of how can we quickly adapt um, and how can we qu- quickly change directions? Um, mm-hmm. And do we have the right people or enough people to make those changes? And the answer was no. We, although like I could personally make changes quickly, that's not scalable um, exactly. as you look to build an organization. Um, and uh, in terms of bringing outside influences for the various um, areas of the business, marketing, photo video editing, copywriting, you know, whatever, um, it would, I knew there'd be some significant value in infusing new blood into the creative stream of the business. And, and coronavirus and COVID really kind of highlighted the need for those things. So it was like a good forced way to kind of do like a SWOT analysis of like, this is what I, this one needs to happen. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so you know, as a result, I've, I've worked to bring on a number of people, um, you know, to help with, uh, you know, re- relaunching the brand. Basically mm-hmm. I have, we're going to start keeping a lot more inventory in stock um, so that we don't have these out of stock issues. And if there is a disruption to our supply chain, you know, we're more insulated and um, you know, as part of growing out the team, the main goal is obviously to increase our top line revenue and our bottom line, you know, profit. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Thank you for interesting. Um, And as we finish up here, I'll be respectful of your time. What are just have like three more left? What's um, you've kind of explained it already, what you're doing for the brand regarding what happened Mm -hmm. with COVID-19, but what do you have like next for the brand? Like, what would you like to see it in the next three, six, 12, et cetera? Mm-hmm. And so the biggest, yeah. So the biggest thing is, as I said, I was already planning to, to invest in the business this year. Mm-hmm. Um, but actually for us, I would argue that coronavirus presented a unique opportunity because we, the last couple of years have kind of been stockpiling cash. And now that there's an opportunity for us to deploy the cash, mm-hmm. um, I think we're actually uniquely positioned, even though consumer appetite to purchase maybe overall lower. We have so much growth that we can capture while other companies are facing significant cash shortages or more significant dis- supply chain disruptions or uh, very high fixed cost structures, which we don't have. Um, I think we are relatively in a relative manner. We are much better positioned to capitalize on, on and make this an opportunity as opposed to like, you know, this is doomsday for us. I mean, yeah, it, it sucks. It hurts, but um, we should emerge very strong from this. So, that's the biggest thing that's going to guide the next, you know, three, six, nine, 12 months um, is how to, how to seize that opportunity and how to capitalize on it. Mm-hmm. Um, so that is bringing on new staff, relaunching the website, um, you know, uh, reimagining how we kind of reimagining the customer journey and how we communicate and engage with our customers, whether it's through new medium, more so on YouTube and on Instagram, you know, build out our, our email kind of uh, campaigns, build out our email list. Um, do we change the voice of the brand slightly? Um, you know, the, the, the website, the voice of the brand are five years old. So, you know, how can we change that to make it more differentiated or more current, um, you know, or more, or more in line with how I really envision the brand? Um, so to me, this is really like a, a renaissance of sorts for Jay Butler. You know, we, we have a good foundation. We know we have some loyal customers. So how can we it's all about scale. How can we scale that? And we're not, we're not venture capital backed where, you know, we didn't go out and raise, you know, millions of dollars. Um, you know, this is a, a truly bootstrap business. Mm-hmm. So it's how can we do this profitably or, right. like, or break even um, is, is really a thing. So it's what can I do to really be judicious in terms of cash management? That's awesome. Man. I just, I love, I kind of, we talked about it before, but the whole purpose of this is just being able to share the minds of other people and how they think. And it's just, I, I just feel like, again, like it, I feel like for me, it would be personally selfish not to share conversations like this, just because the strategies that you have, 
I just love talking to people who have like a vision of what they want to do. And it doesn't have to be in business. Like it can just be in personal development if it's reading, fitness, et cetera. But just yeah. at the end of the day, like it might sound dark, but we only have one life and it's like, there's literally so much that you can do. And there's also so much that you can't do if you're not willing to do anything. Mm -hmm. um, so the last two that I have, yeah, no problem. Um, the last two that I have, first one, um, and then I'll ask the second one is what or who influenced you to influence other people? Mm -hmm. Great question. Um, and that, that, that's a, a, a tough one. Um, so going back to what we were talking earlier about, you know, academics and, and we'll say my lack of, uh, you know, prowess there. Um, some of the teachers I had throughout, throughout, you know, elementary, middle school, high school, you know, college, grad school, um, seeing the effect they could have on the learning process and on myself and other classmates, I thought always found that very inspiring. I've always said, Hey, if I won the lottery, like, you know, I would love to go be a teacher like part-time. Right. Um, you know, it, it's, it's certainly an undervalued profession and underpaid profession, you know, for, for the importance that that profession has on society. Um, and I'm someone who, you know, I, I like nice things. I want to have a lot of money. So it's kind of hard to have that while you're a teacher, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, so I always thought it'd be awesome to go back and, and to become a teacher, um, to share insights and experience. Um, so there are some teachers that I had. Um, uh, my parents obviously would be one, um, you know, looking to, you know, they, they were looked to how can they, um, you know, where they grew up, they didn't want to necessarily raise their families in the same towns or the same states or whatever. So, you know, realizing that sacrifice must be made, whether it's, you know, moving out to San Francisco from, from the East Coast, um, you know, or, uh, you know, going to work for the man in hopes of maybe one day being able to go back to work for yourself, like stuff like that. It's not always going to come easily. Um, so my parents would, would be another one. Um, and uh, an old sponsor I had in, in AA, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, he was a, a big influence on me for, for a while. Uh, he was very successful and I looked to him for advice in business, but also, you know, how to interact and, and deal with people and deal with, you know, myself as well. Because half the battle is not just dealing with other people in entrepreneurship, but it's dealing with yourself as we, we spoke about earlier. Mm -hmm. um, so those would probably be some of the, the, the key people. Um, I've never been someone who necessarily looks towards like celebrities mm -hmm. um, for inspiration, um, maybe athletes. Um, you know, I, thinking of famous people, you know, Ralph Lauren would, would be one in terms of building yeah. a brand and having, you know, a vision for a brand, uh, not mm -hmm. to be too cliche. Um, you know, I, I could argue Dick Hane, uh, Philadelphia Ties, you know, Urban Outfitters, Anthropology, you know, he, he being another one, um, although he's not the face of his brand at all, um, but having an idea for a concept of a brand and, and, and building that out, um, I think is, has been impressive. And then, you know, as I look over my bookshelf, you know, the first book I see is, is Shoe Dog from Phil Knight. Um, you know, it's a great, great book. And what I loved about it is he, he talked about like, you know, how much of a grind it was at times. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of entrepreneurship stories don't talk about that. Yeah. Uh, and I think that is, you know, a disservice to readers at times. The story of him, I just love the, it's not really, really, the story when he talks about how he had to make pay. I can't remember the exact amount it was. And it was mm -hmm. like, then he went to his suppliers, like, hey, if I don't make pay, you don't like, it was just the yeah. way that he just put it together. Um, and then honestly, the way the book ends of like how he's like, oh, maybe I should write a book. I wonder mm -hmm. if the person still has the notes. I'll be right back. It's just, yeah. That, yeah, <laughs> that, that book was it was one of those, like, it started, I guess, the expectations that I had were like, oh, this is going to be Nike, like, I'm going to be learning so mm -hmm. much, but I had to let that go, because the book, again, like what you just said, I think the reason why I might put off some people is because it's so true, like, it's, there's no, he doesn't start off flashy, it's just start from, from the dumps mm -hmm. all the way up, um, yeah, by the way, yeah. uh, thank you for, thank you for sharing that. Um, oh, yeah. oh, actually, two things I should add, mm -hmm. um, if, if you don't mind, the first yes. is, just a, a desire to kind of pay forward what I've learned and to help other people out, uh -huh. you know, like with the final gentleman is like, okay, how can I help other guys dress better too? Yeah. Um, and then I, I spent a lot of time EMTing, volunteering as an EMT you know, oh, and, wow. and stuff back in Philadelphia. And so there it was like, okay, you know, what, what's a way to give back to the community that I grew up in. Um, and although it's not directly influencing, but there's still that kind of um, you know, pay it forward type of, of mentality that I think anyone who is, you know, there's the influencing to influence for like commercial gain, which is, is fine. 
and there's the influencing to you know be a steward of a culture or a steward of an organization which is or of a mindset which is i think another type of, of influence and for me it's been you know kind of a combination of the two at different times and that's and it's i'm just like an outer words just because it's the same mindset having where it's like at the end of the day we have you know, we have, there's a cliche line, I think, I don't know what song it's from, like, we have all these blessings just to share with other people. And like, mm -hmm. it's at the end of the day, it's true, like, all the knowledge that you have, it's even better when you share it with other people, or just, even if it's not your knowledge, it can just be a simple action, because mm -hmm. then that person's going to think, like, wow, Justin took his time out of the day to do a podcast. It's like, wow, like, if this dude has an hour of his time to be able to do this, what can I be able to do with someone else? And then it just mm -hmm. creates even more and more. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, what would you say some lat like the very last thing before we you tell everyone uh, where they can find you? But what are some words of advice for for anyone watching this? Old, mm -hmm. young, high school, college, in a career, maybe they want to be in the fashion industry. I have a couple of people mm -hmm. who just graduated from state. Um, but what are some words of advice to to those people? Mm -hmm. Uh, let's see, I'll, I'll try and put this in like four or five different, you know, bullet points. So I have a couple like, uh, you know, mottos or like things I kind of live by. One is I already said sacrifice must be made. You know, sometimes you have to sacrifice social life for school or for starting a business. Um, there's always light at the end of the tunnel, um, which is kind of the same as, you know, pain is always temporary. Um, whether it's loss or, um, you know, a lack of success, like you should, be optimistic in, in believing that, you know, it can get better and hopefully will get better. Um, people are almost always more willing to offer advice and help than you may think they are. Um, and in fact, um, once you do ask someone for ad advice and help, it, it does help solidify a relationship because you feel like there is a, a common goal or a common feeling of, um, you know, mutual benefit or, um, you no know, goodwill towards both parties. Um, mm -hmm. That is in the sense of if you're not just using someone for connections or using someone for, um, you know, advice, but if there's more of a two-way street, um, you know, I've, I've found that, you know, people are almost always more willing to offer advice than you may initially think. Right. Um, and, and along those lines, you're obviously, again, cliche, but you're not going to, uh, you're not gonna know the answer until you ask. So don't be afraid to ask for advice or ask for help. That's a big way how I got Jay Butler going was, reaching out to random shoemakers, you know, across the U S and random, you know, factories across the U S saying, Hey, like, you know, I write a blog and I'm looking to start a company. Can I just come visit your factory? I just haven't been to a factory. And I'm really curious how they operate. Mm -hmm. I know you make suits, you know, I'm looking to have shoes made, but I'd love to see just kind of the flow of goods through uh, an assembly line. And the other thing is, which kind of relates to that is what are concepts and learnings that you can use in one aspect of your life? And apply that into other aspects of your life. Um, a good example for me is the work I've done as uh, an EMT. You know, like the first thing you learn as an EMT, at least I learned, the first is that, well, it's technically not legal for you to run a red light when you have your lights and sirens going. Mm -hmm. You're still liable. <laughs> uh, the, the first important thing we learned um, was that it's all about ABC, airway breathing circulation. Um, and so in business, you can think, okay, what's your airway? What What's breathing? What's circulation? If, if you don't have a clear or patent airway, then you're going to die because you can't breathe. Mm -hmm. If uh, someone's not breathing, then like they may already be dead in circulation. Like if your blood is like spurting out of your, you know, your arteries and like, that's probably a problem. But the most important is, do they have a clear airway? Because if they can't, then without air, you can't breathe. So for business, I would say the airway part is cash. If you don't have cash flow, then you're doomed. If you don't have working capital, you're doomed. Um, so it's, it's about prioritization. And when you look at a business and kind of what I did with Jay Butler, it's like, how do you go into a situation? And, and even when I worked at Walmart as, as a buyer there, it's like, how do you look at your business and your P&L and figure out what are your biggest priorities and what are your weaknesses or what are biggest problems that you need to focus on? Um, and then cr create kind of a structure and a framework um, to tackle those. And, and that's, I think the last thing I'll leave you with is um, you know, I didn't always do a great job of structuring my approach to things, including Final Gentleman and Jay Butler in the beginning. And as I've gone more through school and my time at Walmart and in other endeavors of life, the value of adding structure to how I approach things and in particular if that structure can be more scalable, um, there's a lot of value in that. And that's not something that I paid much mind to, uh, you know, 10 years ago.
wow, incredible. I feel like I just came from school right now, honestly. Like, I'm going to be re rewatching, always rewatch these, like, immediately after. And it's just amazing just because, like, the, the knowledge honestly dropped. Um, this is a completely off topic, but I wish they could have, these are just some of the things I, I wish I learned, like, in school. Like, you know, there's, like, I'm not saying that we just need the general ed, but the stuff like personal development and not like woo woo mm -hmm. stuff, but just more like, literally at the end of the day, like, you just said it, like, it's, with anything that you do, it starts with you. Like if you aren't mm -hmm. the whole thing of uh, that airplane, when the mask comes on, like put it on yourself. It's mm -hmm. like, if you're not good, then you are not going to be able to help others in the best way. If you are not in the best way possible. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, so thank you for, for, for sharing everything. What are, where can everybody find you? I'll put the links here, but feel free to share. Like where can everybody find you? Mm -hmm. um, is it okay if people can reach out if they are having like questions or mm -hmm. so? Yeah, well, first, thank, thank you for having me. It's been great to, to chat with you again and, and glad we're keeping in touch. Um, in terms of where people can find me, um, the shoes and, you know, the brand J Butler, J-A-Y-B-U-T-L-E-R, it's jbutler.com. On Instagram, it's jbutlershoes. Mm -hmm. um, if they want to reach out to me or the brand, they can just email help at jbutler.com. And then the, uh, you know, if they have like professional questions, I guess they can like find me on LinkedIn and mm -hmm. I'm not very active there, but you know, it may take me a month to respond, like no joke, but Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're welcome to find me there. Um, and then for, uh, just put a note saying, Hey, you know, I, I heard you on, you know, speaking with Emmanuel, so then I have some context. Right. Um, and then, uh, for the blog, it's the fine young Um, and on Instagram, it's F Y G blog. Sweet. Awesome. Sounds good. Great, man. Sweet.